We're starting a new series. Uh, we're going to look at one of the Apostle Paul's early letters. I don't know how long we're going to be on it. Today, we're just going to look at the first two verses. So if we keep that track record, we're going to be on it for quite a while. Now, this letter was written to a church that in all likely, but the letter, you know, it's kind of many of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, they would go to a church, but they were meant to be read in all the churches because a lot of them were established like in Turkey in a, in a fairly close geographical area. So this might be what's considered a circular letter. The book of Ephesians is a very rich book. And so what I want us to do today as we kind of give this overview is I want us to look at three things, three points that are found even in just the first two verses and are supported by the third verse. First thing I want us to look at is why this book matters. Why, why would we spend time reading it? Why does it matter to us as a church? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, is what about who wrote it? Is there anything about the author of this book? Why is it important? And then finally, we want to look at to whom the book is addressed and what that means for us. So why the book matters, why the author matters, and why it all matters to us. That's what we're going to look at. So we want to read it, want to think about it, want to apply it. I welcome you to read it over the next couple of months and see what the Lord does. You know, I was thinking, given the ice that's around... And the fact that a while back, I was skiing in Colorado, as you all know by now, and it was cold. And I think these are the coldest, probably the coldest two weeks of my life ever, as I sit and think about it. Not that it's bad, but, but that's just a fact. And when we were in Colorado, it was interesting. The place where we stayed was 20 minutes from where we were going skiing. But just like their weather alerts here, their weather alerts there, and they were more extreme. And so what would normally be a 20-minute drive from where we were to where we were skiing on a, on a clear day, well, it wasn't normal. There's wind gusts, there's blowing snow, there's ice, there's snow-packed roads, and I didn't tell Marilyn any of this. There's bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. It wasn't a normal day, and it took us twice as long to get to where we were going. Now, if I was behind the wheel, I'm pretty sure that there's a reasonable chance that we wouldn't have made it. I don't know how far we'd have made it, but I suspect something, something would happen. And the reason that I suspect that is because I don't really feel like I have the driving acumen to get us down that kind of travail. I mean, I do all right in normal conditions, but I didn't grow up in Louisiana. It's not exactly the, the snow mecca of the world in central Louisiana. I mean, if you want to drive in the snow, you need to get up at 6 because it's going to be gone by 8. That's once every 10 years. But, you know, it seems to me, this is a little background, that, that there's many professing Christians that, that, that drive down the road of life under normal conditions. They're fine, but life isn't always like that. I mean, sometimes the snow freezes into a slick batch of ice. Sometimes as we're going along, there are hazards and there are hardships on the road to our destination. And as a result, Christians can from time to time lose confidence in whether or not they're going to make it when they're in a rough patch, when they're in hard times, and we wonder. And our faith, our faith can waver. We're unsure about God. We're unsure about ourselves. And as a result, we can become uh, timid, even tepid, you could say, in our walks with Christ, like I'd be... <laughs> trying to drive in blowing snow. And I think that's because we either forget what we have in Christ or we choose not to believe what God says about us and about his unique involvement in the lives of everyone that trusts him. Well, there's good news. I wasn't doing the driving when we were up in Colorado. Our son-in-law was, Josh. And he had two things in his favor. The first thing is that Josh is from Wisconsin, and he, he, he used to ride a, drive a snowmobile to, to school, to high school, so he kind of knew what he was doing. He knew how to drive in freezing weather, if anybody does, and the second thing was that he rented the car, and he knew what to get. He knew to get an all-wheel drive car, and so what happened was that his knowledge and experience 
gave us great comfort and great confidence, and he got us securely to our destination because of what he knew and because of his experience. And you see, the reason this little book, the reason that the whole Bible actually matters to us is because it's written to tell us that in Christ, we have all that we need to enable us to securely reach our destination, no matter what hazards and hardships come our way. So that's kind of the background. And let's look at the book this way. You can really break it down. There's six chapters. You can break it down in two parts. The first part would be what we have in Christ. You could say that's our wealth in Christ. And then the fourth, fifth, and sixth chapter talked about how to apply it, our walk with Christ, our wealth in Christ, and our walk with Christ. And so we're going to spend a good bit of time on the first three chapters talking about what we have in Christ. That's a phrase that's used, I don't know, 160 times in the New Testament. It's someone, something to know. The wealth we have in Christ. You probably heard of instances where a person comes into a lot of money. You know, they, they, they receive an inheritance or they win the lottery. And the people that win the lottery, they're interviewed. They, they, they say, don't worry. This good fortune isn't going to change us. We're not going to do anything different. We're going to continue to be just like we are. And when I hear someone, I don't know if you've ever heard someone say that I've, several times, and I think to myself, that's crazy talk. You're rich. It should make a difference in your life. You should be able to live differently with all these resources that you now have. You ought to think about it. You ought to live differently. And you see, the resources that we have in Christ that are way more than winning the lottery should enable us to live differently. And they do. They enable us to live supernaturally. That's why if you just look at the first couple of chapters, you see words like riches used five times. The riches that we have as believers in Christ. Chapter 1, verse 7 speaks of the riches of his grace. Chapter 3, the unfathomable riches in Christ. Chapter 3, again, the riches of his glory. And there's other words in this book like the words full and fill and filled up lavished upon us. God has lavished upon us. That's a good term to describe the riches that God has sourced in Jesus Christ. Preacher John MacArthur out of California sums it up by saying, Christ is the source, the sphere, and the guarantee of every spiritual blessing and of all spiritual riches. And those who have placed their faith in him have gained access into all that he has and to all that he is. That's a wonderful thing. So the point of all this is that when a person places their faith in Christ, you know, they're not, you know, Jesus saved, you know, they're not just saved from the penalty of sin. You know, they're not just, just, just released from prison to go live their life the best that they can when they have all these habit patterns of their past life. But when a person places their faith in Christ, they're not only released from their debt of sin, but they're given all the resources abundantly in order to live the life that pleases God, in order to help us learn how to enjoy him. It's a process. It's a road. But we have what we need so that we can enjoy him. That's why he made us in the first place. So this book says a lot, and it matters greatly to the church. That's the first idea. It's a good thing. Second idea is we talk about who wrote it. You know, the Apostle Paul. Now, what does that mean? You know, he, he starts his letter like that. You know, we, our times, times today are changing mighty fast, aren't they? You know, we live in a different age. Social media, look at the impact of social media. A person can, can, can be anonymous, and yet they can speak on anything, whether they're an expert or not. And so when you read it, you agree or disagree, and you think, well, I'm going to follow them because I think they're right. And really, all you're saying is, I have the same opinions. They must be right. You know, and they can say stuff, hateful stuff, hurtful stuff, and they can re remain anonymous. I saw a clip of a, a, a Canadian politician and he was being interviewed and he was standing there and he was eating an apple and a reporter was asking him while he's eating the apple sir it's reported that you and he who reported it who said that takes another bite of the apple well well it's common the report well it's common well, common to who who's it common to and this went on for several minutes and the point that the 
politician was trying to make was, who are these people that are saying these things? How can I respond to people if I don't even know who they are? And do these people have some kind of authority or some kind of expertise to make me want to listen to them, to make them want to make these claims? That's what social media has done. It was really funny. Paul's not some social media wannabe. Paul is an apostle. Paul calls himself an apostle. Now, what is an apostle? Well, in the loose sense, what it means is one who is sent. You could call, in the loose sense, you could call a missionary one who is sent. So in that sense, they're an apostle. But in the sense that Paul is using is unique, and it's unique to that time. It's unique to, to uh, uh, Peter and Paul and, and, and John and, and, and Matthew and, and, all those, and all those original apostles. Because they were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Remember Paul in Acts, he met Jesus in a blinding light on the road to Damascus. And Jesus said, you're going to go to the Gentiles. Jesus was commissioning him and giving him his unique authority personally to be an apostle. And there's no apostles like this today. They're ones who are sent, but they're not commissioned directly by Jesus Christ. And, and, and the, the word of God is grounded and founded upon the words of the apostles. That's why we have things like the Apostles' Creed. Paul's one of the originals. Paul is unique. Paul carries weight. And God used Paul to start the churches in Ephesus and other places and to spread the gospel in the surrounding area. He used Paul to write these letters and to communicate his word. And Paul knows what he's talking about. Let me think about it. Think if you know anything about his life, he experienced a major turnaround when he met Jesus Christ. Something was radically different. He went from persecuting Christians to being one himself. And on a good day, after he was preaching the gospel, on a good day, he was run out of town for proclaiming the gospel. And on a bad day, he was beaten. There's even times when he was speaking to people about the very thing that we believe in. And because of it, he was beaten and he was left for dead. And he continued to share the message. You know, he and his buddy, Silas, were in a Philippian jail. Now, a dark, dank place. Now, what if you were put in jail? You know, this is a mistake. I didn't do it. I'm upset. Paul and Silas were singing hymns in prison. What a response to such a horrible, horrible thing. There's something about him. He had a testimony. So Paul, the apostle, is the human author that God used to communicate his unique word to the church. And he is an incredible witness to the truth of the gospel. So we need to listen. You know, it's like uh, those old E.F. Hutton commercials. Well, E.F. Hutton, you know, we need to listen to what Paul says. Now, the last thing is this. To whom is he writing? And it says this, says, to the saints who are faithful. You know, just think about that for a minute. He's written to the saints. Who are now, when you think of the word saint, what do you think of? You think of a really good person, don't you? We think of a selfless person. We think of our grandmother. Or we think of our mother. We think of somebody else we know. We think of Mother Teresa. Oh, the sacrifices that she has made. She's a cut above. She is wonderful. She is a saint. That's what we think of, their behavior, what they've done. Raise your hand if you think of yourself as a saint. <laughs> okay, one, two. I see those hands. No, we don't usually think of ourselves as a saint. But you know what? This is written to the saints. Then what is he talking about? He's calling the members of the church in Ephesus saints. What that word means is someone who is set apart. Some of the translations say holy people. Same idea. The word means set apart. By whom? By God. What does that look like? When I was in eighth grade, the football coach came to me before the season, and he says, I want you to be the quarterback. I'm going, he's obviously never seen me play. But in a sense, what happened was he set me apart. He set me apart from the rest of the student body because he's offering me a place on the football team. And not only that, I was distinct on the football team because 
The coach had set me there to be quarterback. He had a purpose for me. I had a new position. And that's the idea here. Every saint is set apart by God for a purpose. There's just a couple of problems. I was a really scrawny kid. I mean, when I lined up under center, you know, it's like this. I mean, I could see the defense you know, looking through the quarter, looking through the center's legs. I was scrawny, and also my friend Chuck was the first string quarterback, so that meant I was a second string quarterback. And so the first game came up, and my friend Chuck had a pretty bad game, and a change was, 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 was about to happen. So I'm going, all right, here we go. So at practice, the, the week following the game, the coach blew the whistle, and he raised his hand and waved for a new quarterback. Only problem was he, ra- he waved to the split end. So the split end became the quarterback, and I became the third-string quarterback. Well, guess what? I never... I never got in the game. Here I was set apart, not only in the school, but on the team, and yet I never got in the game. Now, I wonder if they're churchgoers who believe in Jesus Christ. They're saints because they believe in Jesus Christ. They're set apart. They're on the team. But they don't seem to be getting in the game. This book is written for those folks. Listen to one of the greatest verses in this book, the book of Ephesians, and you're familiar with it. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. You have been saved by God through the means of the faith he has given you. But then the verse right after that says this. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the works that he has prepared beforehand for us to do, for us to walk in. So you see, a saint is a person who is set apart by God to do what God has given them to do. And we're never done with being given stuff to do by God, no matter how old we are, or no matter where we are, or no matter what our circumstances are. Set apart to figure out how to, how, to, how to follow Christ, how to honor Christ. That's one of the things that a saint means. Writing it to the saints, the people that are set apart. Now, there's one quality mentioned in this verse that a saint has that's required to be a saint. And it says to all the saints who are faithful. Now, when we think of that word, and it's, 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 it's true, it's good, we might think what? Loyal. We might think like a, like a, like a faithful family pet. Like your dog who's always going to meet you at the door or tell you when he's hungry or needs to go outside. We think of one who can be counted on. We think of reliable, faithful. In a sense, a saint is faithful in this way. But what this word literally means is full of faith. Full of faith. And what it implies is that saints are people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They depend on his work, his finished work on the cross that's enough to save them, and they trust Jesus Christ. They have faith in him. So that's what a saint is. And this book is written to those, whatever our condition is, this book is written to us. Speaking of, since we're talking about cold weather, I read an illustration of a man in Canada, and he was was trying to cross a river and he wasn't sure of the ice. And so he, he, he gets out on the river and he puts his left hand out there. And then he puts his right hand and he gingerly moves a little farther, trying to kind of hover, if he could, above the, above the frozen river because he didn't want to fall into the river. And that'd be really bad. And so as he was doing this, he heard a big commotion in the snow behind him. And he turned and there was a team of galloping horses coming right at him. And he didn't know what to do. So all he could do was was just stay there, barely on the ice, being as still as he could. And he watched as these galloping horses galloped from the land to the river and galloped across the river on that ice. What an amazing thing. He never realized that this river, that this ice, was firm enough to carry the weight of galloping horses. Of course it's enough to support him. 
And you see, our foundation as children of God is like that ice. It's strong and it's firm and it's solid. It's, it's more than enough. If it can, it's enough for these horses. It's enough for us. In fact, speaking of foundation, there's no other foundation. There's no greater foundation that one can have than Jesus Christ. And see, that's what this book is all about. We have more than we need because of the grace of God that's found in Jesus Christ. Our destination is secure. You see, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is a saint, and that's a very good thing. And they may not feel like a saint all the time. Man, if people knew what I was thinking... Gosh, but we are. Why? Because of our works, because we do well enough to feel good about ourselves? No, because God has set us apart in Jesus Christ. You and me, we're set apart and we're treasured by the grace of God. Good overview of the book. We'll get to the third verse next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have initiated with us, and we forget that. Sometimes we feel guilty. Oh, look what you've done for me, and look how I repay you. And yet our debt is already paid. Help us to look at our lives through the lens of your your grace, your wonderful grace. In your son's name we ask. Amen.